just before we sing our next uh, hymn, I just wanted to read to you a passage, a well-known passage from Psalm 100 and, oops, 139. Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. It says, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. It says, you're familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, Lord. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge, it's just too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. <clears throat> but where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise, if I rise on the wings of the dawn, or if I settle even on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. You know, this psalm speaks of the intimacy uh, of God, our Father. And we are His children. And no matter what season we find ourselves in life, whether we are just experiencing incredible joy or the deepest, deepest distress, we know that we have a God who loves us and He holds us uh, in the palm uh, of His hands. It's, we're going to sing a song now called, He Will Hold Me Fast. Hold on to that psalm as you sing this hymn together.
Remain standing for a moment as we pray uh, together. He will hold me fast. Father, I pray for those of us this morning who need to know that. For all of us. Lord, that we would know the security that could be found uh, in you. Thank you, Lord, that no thing no one, no circumstance can take us out of your hand. Lord, we thank you for your steadfast commitment and faithfulness to us. Lord, even when we don't feel secure in your love, may we have a sense of that security by your Spirit. Lord, as we come and look at your word, Lord, I pray that uh, you would help us to get a handle on it and to see where we might be able to apply what your word tells us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please do uh, take your seats. And if you either have a Bible, a hard copy, or maybe uh, you've got your phone or a device, uh, please can I encourage you to Turn to Proverbs chapter 1 and verses 1 uh, to 7. So that's Proverbs chapter 1 and verses uh, 1 to 7. I'm not going to get very far without my glasses, I'm afraid. Sign of my age. Okay, so the purpose, the, so the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. For, gain, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. For understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and the riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise uh, wisdom and uh, instruction. So Chrissy uh, and I, we like to go to uh, Savile Gardens. Uh, anybody here have ever been to Savile Gardens before? Beautiful place. Uh, I recommend you go a place to unwind, a place to go out in God's creation. It's in Windsor Park, a, w a wonderful place to go. And Chrissy and I were there a couple of weeks ago. And we, <clears throat> we went for a coffee. Uh, in, there's like a little coffee house uh, in Savile Gardens. And for a moment, the atmosphere changed because somebody famous walked in to the room. And all you could see are these men just kind of whispering to their, to their wives, look who it is, look who it is. And I found myself doing the same thing to Chrissy. I said, look who it is, look who it is. And Chrissy says, who is it? I said, what do you mean, who is it? It's Rory McIlroy. He's the number one golfer in the whole entire world, Rory McIlroy. And she's like, Rory who? It's Rory McIlroy. Well, she teased me for the rest 
uh, of the day because I was a little starstruck because kind of Rory is kind of one of my kind of heroes. He's an Irish golfer and he's been incredibly uh, successful uh, over the years. Well, I mentioned Rory because I think there are some uh, principles, as it were, in his kind of daily discipline that I think we can bring into the discipline uh, of our spiritual uh, walk with the Lord. And we'll think about that a little later. You know, this morning we're continuing uh, the preaching series that I started uh, a couple of weeks ago on the book of Proverbs. Now, by, by way of reminder, uh, you, if you were here then, you'll remember that I said that the first nine chapters of Proverbs are a bit like an introduction. Uh, they're a bit like a kind of a, the key, as it were, that unlocks all of the Proverbs and all of these kind of sayings in chapters 10 to 29. So we really want to get a handle on Proverbs 1 to 9 first before we look at 10 to 29. I'm not going to look at 10 to 29, but for this series, I'm looking at Proverbs chapter 1 to verse chapter 9. And really the overriding principle of Proverbs is two things. It's wisdom and it's foolishness. Proverbs personifies wisdom over here is calling to us. Come and embrace me. Come and embrace God's ways for your life. Whereas Proverbs also says there's another lady called, a personification called Lady, lady Folly. And there's a foolishness that's also calling us, tempting us away from God. And it's our choice. What path are you going to follow? Are you going to follow the path of wisdom, how God's created you to live? Or are you going to follow the path of foolishness and a life rejecting God's ways for you? Well, the first thing we want to notice in this, these first seven uh, verses is just that the, the training in the school of biblical wisdom, it's a process, okay? It's not going to happen overnight. It's a process. In fact, if you were to look at all the verbs of those verses that I've read out to you, they often end with the word ing, present tense, ing, it's happening. So look at verse 2 and 3. These proverbs are for gaining wisdom and instruction, therefore understanding uh, words of insight, therefore receiving instruction and prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair. If you were to go to verse 5, it says, let the, wise, let the wise listen and add to their learning. You don't get to a place where you're 35, 45, 55, think, that's it, I've got it down now. Wisdom, piece of cake. It's not at all. It's a life process of learning and uh, embracing uh, God's wisdom. Another observation of this text in this passage, the first seven verses, you'll notice that the word instruction happens on three occasions. Uh, verse three, verse, uh, 2, verse 3, and verse 7. And for those of you who like the 1984 NIV translation, like, like I do, you may notice that actually it's not instruction, it says discipline. Now, when you hear the word discipline, I wonder what comes to your mind. Maybe it's a harsh school teacher, maybe that you uh, had when you were younger. In his book, Conformed to His Image, the author, Kenneth Boa, he writes this. For many people, the word discipline has negative connotations. We often associate it with tyranny, external restraint, legalism. But he says a closer look at Scripture reveals that the very opposite is true. It says the book of Proverbs, he says, for instance, argues that far from limiting our freedom, personal t disciplines enhance our freedom. They give us options we could never have had otherwise. He says wisdom is a skill that is developed through instruction and discipline. And this skill in the art of living under the Lord's will frees us to become the kind of people God intends. So the Bible paints a very positive picture on discipline. You know, we see it all the time, don't we? Those of you who are musicians, how many times have you spent hours and hours and hours and you've been practicing and practicing and then you've just had the enjoyment of being able to, to play music, maybe either individually or, or in a band? 
Maybe it's the skilled surgeon who's just practiced in hours and hours and, and has mastered the skill of surgery and, and has brought healing and, and some, a freedom from maybe suffering to another individual. I mentioned uh, Rory McElroy earlier on. He's got an incredibly disciplined uh, lifestyle. Let me go through his daily routine with you for a moment. So in the morning, he gets up at 6.30. Uh, for breakfast, he has Greek yogurt with blueberries or strawberries and some poached eggs on wholemeal toast. Does that sound like your breakfast? I didn't think so. It's not mine. Uh, wholemeal toast. He spends some time with his family, and then he goes off for a 90-minute workout in the gym. 90 minutes, an hour and a half in the gym. Well, he does that. He has his shower, and then he heads off to the practice ground, and he spends about three hours there just hitting golf balls backwards and forwards, getting all the golf, getting the driver out, getting the three iron. Those of you who are golfers, by the way, I'm talking golf slang if you don't understand golf. But it's all the golf, all the golf uh, clubs in his bag. He'll get them all out. And he'll probably have his instructor, his coach here, just watching him. No, Rory, I think yeah, your swing's not quite right today. Just, your, your alignment's not right today. And he'll be working on that and working on that day after day, hour after hour. Then he comes back for lunch. Lunchtime, it's grilled chicken, steak or fish, and vegetables. And then back off to the golf course again, 9, 15, uh, 18 holes. Uh, he comes back, uh, checks out his uh, social media, his emails, settles down for the night. And in the end, when he goes to sleep, he'll put on this whoop sleep monitor. Anybody heard of a whoop sleep monitor? Well, apparently it monitors your sleep and it's able to detect how deeply you've been sleeping so he can even monitor his sleep. So Rory will play in a tournament uh, Thursday, how it normally works in the professional golf circuit. It's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and they're in the scrutiny of the world scene. You've got interviewers, you've got the media, you've got the pressure of the tournament. You know, it's five hours, to, four or five hours to get around the golf course, and it's high pressure. But you know what? What kind of helps Rory perform in those pressurized environments is the preparation he had during the week. It's the discipline he had when he's practicing his golf, when he's working out, when he's, when he's feeding himself uh, well. You might think, so Barry, why on earth are you <laughs> telling me about this? Well, I think there's some things we can learn from this kind of principle. You see, in a similar way, I would suggest that God wants to weave his wisdom, weave the spiritual disciplines into our lives. He wants to meet us in those quiet moments, maybe when we're on our own, because then we're going to move into the pressurized moments when we have the demands of our lives. Look at, if we were to look at Hebrews, Chapter 12, verse 11, it says this. It says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. But later on, however, it produces what? It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace by those who get it in a minute, who get it in one day. No. Let me read that again. It says, It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Discipleship is a process. It's a training. It takes time cultivating and developing spiritual disciplines. And let me ask you this morning, how is your training in the school of biblical discipline, biblical wisdom and spiritual disciplines going? We've all got 168 hours every week. How do you spend those 168 hours? Where are you strengthening yourself spiritually? Where are you feeding yourself spiritually in your devotional daily routine so that when you are ready for the, so when you do face the pressures of life and the demands of work and family and, and all sorts of other things, you're prepared and you're ready. Well, let's think of the, some of the practical ways that we can try and embrace some of these spiritual disciplines and kind of include them uh, in our everyday daily routines. And the first is obvious, isn't it? It's prayer. 
we really need to be prioritizing setting aside time to pray, whether that's five minutes, 10 minutes, 15, 30, whatever you uh, feels right. We need time to pray, not just individually, but gathering with others. We need the discipline of praying with others. Come along this evening. Let's pray together and ask God to work through us, in and through us. So prayer is a spiritual discipline. Bible study is a spiritual discipline. Find a good Bible reading if you haven't already got one, a good Bible reading plan online. Maybe you've got Every Day with Jesus notes. Maybe you've got some sort of other Bible devotional notes. Come and speak to me about joining a small group to study the Bible if you're not with getting with other people at the moment. So prayer, Bible study, journaling. Do any, any of you do any journaling? You know, when you just have a diary and maybe you make a note of some of the things that you kind of sense, yeah, this is what God is maybe saying to me. I want to encourage you as we head into, you know, Derek's final um, preaching series is on the Gospel of Mark. A couple of staff members uh, have are ahead of the game, okay? They've got a, a, a Mark's gospel. It's kind of like a, a, a journal, a diary, and you've got Mark's gospel on one side and a blank page on the other where you can take notes, and they're ready for, for, for uh, Derek's, Derek's gospel um, preaching series. So how about you? If you've never journaled before, why not maybe do something like that? Get into it and say, Lord, how are you, what do you want to say to me? So we've got prayer, Bible study, journaling, Another spiritual discipline is, is kind of solitude and silence. When was the last time you'd booked a Christian retreat just to kind of remove yourselves from the hustle and bustle of life and the temptations uh, that we face? I'm planning to do that myself uh, in, in May, just to take a couple of days out and spend some time in an abbey in Sussex. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm not sure what it's going to be like. I just think the first few hours I'm going to be like, I'm just busy thinking in my mind because I'm, no, I'm not into the discipline of, of, of slowing down. But I think it'll be good because it's in the quiet. It's in times of solitude, but it's just you and the Lord that start to kind of tune in to the voice of, of the Holy Spirit. What, what's he saying to me? Sometimes we're so busy getting on and doing life that we never quieten ourselves down. Listen to the gentle voice of God. So there's prayer, Bible study, journaling, uh, solitude and silence, and fasting. There's another spiritual discipline. When was the last time you and I fasted? When was the last time we skipped a meal so we had more time uh, for prayer? Now, I understand, of course, some folk for health reasons can't necessarily fast. That's all right. But for most of us, we could skip a meal or here, here or there and, and set aside time to pray. Or if it's not food, maybe it's, maybe it's uh, just fasting your mobile phone. Just switch it off one day. There was a time when we didn't have mobile phones and we seemed to cope all right, I think. One of my friends decided actually he would uh, pack up his TV and put it in the loft for a week. He didn't know what to do with himself. He had so much time in the evenings. And, but you know what? He found actually, I've got some time now. I can, I can pray. I can spend time with God. Are you willing to grow in these spiritual disciplines? Just look at the Gospels and you'll see Jesus practice these spiritual disciplines all the time. You know what? Jesus was busy. <laughs> Jesus was incredibly busy. In Mark chapter 6, we read the apostles, they gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they, they had done and taught. Then, it says, because so many people were coming and going, can you sense the hustle and bustle that Jesus and the disciples are in? That they didn't even have a chance to eat, they didn't even have time to prepare a meal. They were busy. What did Jesus say to his disciples? He says, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Come with me to a quiet slip place by yourselves and get some rest. Have you got that in your life? Have you got a place where you can come away and be with Jesus? You know, we've got so many demands in our life, work, 
family, children's clubs, appointments, meetings, TV, social media, you add to the list. But Jesus invites us to come away with him. The author, Tony Horsfall, he says this. He says, we're human beings, not human doings. He says, we need time to be with our Father in heaven. We receive from God and then we give into the world. It's a bit like a rhythm of life. You know, you've got the tide coming in. The tide comes out. You know, we breathe in. We breathe out. See, unless we receive from God, we've just got nothing to give in the rest and the other areas of our lives. But it'll take learning self-control. It'll take learning wisdom's secrets. And Jesus is the perfect wisdom instructor. Let's think a little bit about the foundation of all biblical wisdom. I've been um, watching a documentary, I don't know if you've seen it, on the developments in Claridge's Hotel. A really interesting documentary. It's been on BBC recently. And for the last seven years, Claridge's has gone, undergone a huge uh, development. And a group of specialist miners from my own county, I'm proud to say, in Donegal, they've been brought over to create, if you like, imagine this is Claridge's. They've come to dig a five-story basement. And they've got all these luxurious kind of spas and swimming pools and restaurants. Of course, they can't expand sideways, so they've gone and expanded uh, downwards. Well, in order to be able to facilitate this, they had to create 62 circular shafts, about 1.8 meters uh, in diameter. They had to fill each of these 62 shafts with reinforced concrete columns into each one in order to provide support for this 200-year-old Victorian uh, building. Without these 62 circular shafts to support it, <laughs> Claridge's is just going to collapse. You know, if the book of Proverbs, as the comparison was like Claridge's, the foundation of wisdom is found in verse 7. Follow along with me if you have your Bibles open in verse 7. It says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Let me read that again. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You know, the one thing that should be the foundation of our thoughts, the foundation of our behavior, the foundation of our actions, is having this sense of a fear of the Lord. Not a trepidation, not like I'm petrified of the Lord, but just a, a reverence, a sense that, Lord, you're the creator of all. You've created this whole universe. I have this deep love and respect for you. I want to be kind of humble before you. Do you have that? Do you have a sense of reverence uh, before the Lord? See, I'd suggest a society that embraces the fear of the Lord. They're laying the foundations for biblical wisdom. Whereas a society that rejects the fear of the Lord is moving farther and farther away from this wisdom. In the recent census in the UK, uh, 2001, around 70% identified, self-identified as, as Christian, and about 15% identified as having no religion. 20, fast forward to 2021, only 20 years later, 46% identify as Christian, and 37% identify as having no religion. That's a massive shift in 20 years. You see, I'd suggest the difficulty with the increase of a secular uh, worldview that just really cuts out and removes God is that values, right and wrong, good and evil, it just becomes subjective. It becomes a matter of personal opinion. It becomes a matter of experience and, and how, I, how I feel is right and wrong. By contrast, Biblical wisdom is objective. It's not based on personal opinion. 
It's based on God. It's based on his character. It transcends the, the values, biblical values transcend us. We look to him and his nature to define what is right and wrong. Well, what can we take away from this passage today? Well, I think there's two things. There's numerous things, but I think there's two things we can take away. And the first is this. Training in the school of biblical wisdom involves discipline. Remember Rory McIlroy? Remember his daily discipline, uh, preparing him for when he comes into the tournaments and the pressures of that life? In a similar way, how are you preparing to live well under the pressures and demands of life? What spiritual disciplines are you looking to develop in your daily routine? Is it your prayer life? Are you looking to develop your Bible reading? Maybe it's developing journaling. Maybe it's developing solitude. There's moments of solitude and silence in your life. Even if it's, it might be a Christian retreat or it might just be 10 minutes just of silence or quiet. What little steps can you take this week on your journey of growing in these spiritual disciplines. So firstly, training in the school of biblical wisdom involves discipline. Secondly, the foundation of biblical wisdom is to live with the fear of the Lord. Do you have a reverence? Do you have a deep love and respect for God? Do you want to embrace the the biblical values that he's designed you and I to live? He's created us to live this way. Or do you find yourself sliding back into a kind of a secular uh, values of this world that wants to define good and evil on their own terms? My encouragement to us this morning, remember at the start I said wisdom's calling us and foolishness is calling us. My encouragement is just to follow the call of biblical wisdom and to ignore and to reject the foolishness of the values of this world. Let's pray together. Have a moment of quiet just to reflect on those, the verses in that passage. Lord, I pray that you would meet with us. Lord, we all have busy lives. Jesus had a busy uh, life. But Lord, I pray that you help us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Help us to see how he lived his life, how he seemed to find a way of carving time and to pray and to spend time with you and to fast and to just to really slow himself down, to prepare himself for those times of pressure, those times of sharing the gospel and the ultimate horrendous pressure of going to the cross for our sin. Lord, would you help us as we move into a new week, maybe just to take some little steps on our journey with you. Help us to grow as disciples of Christ. Help us to follow your lead. In Jesus' name, amen. And then we're going to respond with one final song before we end our service. And we're going to sing, we bow our hearts, uh, we lift our heads. Why don't we stand for Abel as we worship God together.
Please do take your seats. We've come to the end of our service uh, this morning. Thank you for coming. Just to remind you, we have a, a prayer meeting this evening at 6.30. You're very welcome to come to. Let's just close our service with a word uh, of prayer. Lord, I'm reminded of Paul's words in uh, Romans <coughs> chapter 12, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. For this is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conf be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. Lord, we thank you that you have a good, pleasing, and perfect plan for every single one of us here uh, this morning. Lord, we pray as we go into a new week, as we scatter into our various places, Lord, that we'd have a sense of your spirit among us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you.